This morning, as we gather to worship, as we bow our heads in prayer, as we sing the songs we sing, as we have the moments of quiet, on our hearts and minds are those who've lost loved ones in, in Paris, those who have been injured uh, through those terrible acts. And those acts, and two weeks ago, the downing of the Russian airliner by a terrorist bomb, remind us in a stark and horrific way that what guides our actions matters, and it matters a great deal. What guides our actions matters, and it matters a great deal. Now we see people fleeing from their homes, fleeing persecution. Many thousands of Christians leaving homes that they and their ancestors in the faith and their ancestors in their families have occupied for centuries being driven out. Back in July, there was a headline in the New York Times that said, is this the end of Christianity in the Middle East? We're a long way away, but, and so we may be out of touch with the fact that Christians are under horrific persecution in many places in our world. In fact, a Pew study of religious violence recently said that Christians among all faith groups are persecuted in more countries than any other group in the world today. What guides one's actions matters, and it matters a great deal. So the actions of these terrorists, whether in persecution of people who are not of their faith, persecution of people who are of their own faith, because they don't agree with their version of Islam, What motivates those people? It matters. It matters what one believes, and that leads to the actions that a person takes in his or her life. And Paul knew that. Paul taught about that, and Paul himself lived that. This is the last sermon in the series on Paul, and Remember that Paul himself was a persecutor of the church. Paul himself knew that what guides your actions matters, and it matters a great deal. It, in fact, it is a life and death issue so often. Paul himself had been a persecutor of the church because of this zealous, misguided understanding of God and God's call on his life. And then, after Paul had met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and Paul had that amazing experience where a person of the way, as the Christians were called, called him Brother Saul, as Paul had that amazing experience of meeting Christ and of the acceptance and love from a follower of Christ, Paul then himself became a persecuted person. The book of Acts tells us that when Paul preached in Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki as it's also called, Paul preached there for three years, or sorry, three weeks, he preached in Thessalonica. And during that time, people came to faith, and Paul came to a run-in with the authorities. He was arrested. He was taken before the magistrate there. And the accusation was that Paul and the others who had become followers of Paul and the others who were helping Paul in this spreading of the good news of the grace and love of Christ, that they were turning the world upside down 
is the way the accusation put it. And they were. In fact, it might be good to say they were seeking to turn the world right side up, seeking to bring the good news of the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about, the realm of God, the will and the way of God lived out in our world, to bring that to the people of Thessalonica. So Paul ended up, because of persecution and the threat of it, he had to leave, according to the book of Acts, under cover of darkness. He was concerned about the church, and so he sent Timothy back to find out how the Thessalonians were faring, and he was overjoyed to learn what Timothy learned. And that is, in spite of persecution, in spite of the difficulties of their lives, that their work and their efforts and their perseverance were guided by faith and love and hope. Because what guides our actions matters, and it matters a great deal. And so Paul praised the Thessalonian Christians for who they were and held them up as a, an example of what the church ought to be, what Christians ought to be like. Today, the, even now, as we're gathered here to worship, the United Methodist Committee on Relief and other Christian organizations are at work helping those who are fleeing persecution people of all faiths who are being persecuted, people who are the victims of terrorists whose homes and lives have been ransacked. Our United Methodist Committee on Relief and other Christian organizations are hard at work. And what is it that guides their action? It's what Paul praised the Thessalonian Christians for. It's faith and it's love and it's hope. Paul, in praising the Thessalonian Christians, pointed to their faith. Your work, of, your work that comes from faith, Paul called it. Now, when he talks about work there, he's talking about vocation. That's a good translation for the word he uses there. Vocation is one's calling. It's not just what you do for a uh, a living, but it's what you do with your whole life. It's where it's what you do in volunteering, in playing, and in working, and in worshiping, and in giving, and serving. It's all that you do. That's your vocation. And that vocation, that work, was guided by their faith. And the word can also be translated, by the way, their faithfulness. By faith and faithfulness. Their faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Christ and their faithfulness in following God's call on their lives. That's what motivated and guided their work. This notion of our faith being a part of all that we are in every aspect of our lives and throughout the span of our lives is so central to who we are as people of faith. It's central to what we learn about the life of faith in Scripture. It's central to what we see in the lives of those who've had the biggest impact for good on our world. It is not just in one area, and it's not just in one era of life, but throughout all areas of life and throughout the whole lifespan. Rabbi Philip Pohl, in his tradition, talks about the importance of this. And he says that, he has, with his congregation, tried to instill this notion of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah for the girls, not being just something that happens at age 13, but that throughout life there ought to be this time of examination, this time of learning, this time of committing oneself to one's faith. And so he says, every 13 years we ought to have a recommitment like that. Now think of what that would be like for us as Christians in the congregation. We have confirmation. Confirmation is the time of paying attention, especially close attention, to one's faith, of learning in that period of time 
what the faith is about, of coming to the place of standing before the congregation and making a commitment of one's life and faith to Christ. But what if that happened not just when a person is young at confirmation, but what if it happened every 13 years? As the rabbi suggested to his congregation, what if every 13 years we had that kind of intentional recommitment and thinking through, how does my faith guide my actions? So that at age 26, just when you're into your career or vocation, just as you're deciding all the ways throughout your life, your whole vocation, your career, and perhaps new uh, family members, what does all that mean, and how will it guide my life at 26? And then at 39, midlife, what do I do with the second half of life? And what does it mean to pass into that midlife time? And how will my faith inform my living and my action? And then at 52, maybe it's an empty nest or an empty nest is approaching. Maybe it is a focus on the final lap in the, in the vocation or the career, I should say. What does that mean? And then at age 65, retirement. I love the term that Merrill Lynch used to use, retoolment. Retooling for that period of life. What if, I, what if we focused again and made new commitments at that point in life? I think the rabbi has a great idea. What do you think? What do you think if, if faith so informed and guided our actions that we had these periods of celebration and recommitment throughout our lives? Well, whether we celebrate them every 13 years or not, that's what we're called to do and who we're called to be. Let faith guide your actions. Because what guides your actions matters, and it matters a great deal. Paul pointed to love as well. He said that their effort in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians' effort, came from their love. Now, the word that's translated effort there is a different word from the word translated work. That word means hard work. It means hard labor, difficult. And it is difficult. As Mr. Mark said a moment ago in the children's moment, loving as Jesus calls us to love is really, really hard. It's difficult. And what Paul saw in the Thessalonians is that effort that comes from love. It's difficult at best. It's impossible to feel, to make oneself feel a certain way. So that kind of love is out. I mean, when Jesus says, love your enemies, that's not possible if love is an emotion. It's really not. But if love is the way we act toward other people, it actually, though very difficult, is possible. And that's the... Christian understanding of love. It's unconditional goodwill and acting in that way toward every other person, no matter what. Paul saw that in the Thessalonians, living in such a difficult circumstances as they, uh, circumstance as they lived. He could say, your work, your effort, your hard work comes from love. And it's not just their own love. It's the love of God that really sustains them and strengthens them. It's the presence of God in their circumstance that really makes a difference. It's not only their love, because human effort can only go so far, but it's the love of God at work in them to give them the strength and the courage they need to be who God was calling them to be in their situation. I remember reading sometime back someplace about a pastor who was driving along and saw a truck on the side of the road, a, a cargo truck, and so he pulled off to see if he might render some assistance to the driver, and 
The driver explained that it, everything was fine, that someone was on the way to help. Someone from the company was coming to replace wheel bearings, that the wheel bearings had gone dry and, and uh, had burned out on one of the wheels. And so as the pastor got back in his car and pulled away, he, he couldn't help but notice that what it said on the side of the cargo van, it said Standard Oil Company Lubricants Division. I mean, they're hauling grease. And the wheel bearing had gone dry. He said, that's a parable for us sometimes. You know, we're called to carry this message of God's love. We're called to live and let love guide our actions. And yet, if we do not stay in love with God, stay in relationship with God and with a community of faith to help strengthen us in that, we run dry. We don't have the strength for it. But Paul could point to that church and say, your effort comes from love. Not just your own working at love, but the love of God in you and the love of the faith communities to sustain you. And then finally, he says that their perseverance comes from hope. Hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. That's what sustains them. In the difficult, difficult times, what is it that allows them to continue. It's hope. It's hope in Christ. It's hope that comes from knowing they're not alone in that. It's hope that comes from knowing that this vision that Christ has for the world, this kingdom of God where God's will is done on earth as in heaven, this vision that Jesus had that, that where he said this is coming into being, be a part of this kingdom. That's what gave them hope. That's what gives us hope. When we look at our brothers and sisters who are experiencing persecution and their perseverance and their work, we can see reflections of that in them as well. And we ought to be praying for them. We ought to be working on their behalf in every way we can to support the ministries that are supporting them with their work of that comes from faith and their effort that comes from love and their perseverance that comes from hope. I want to share with you the story of two leaders of the Christian church that come from the 13th century, the turn of the 13th century. The first is a, a pope. He was made pope unanimously in 1198. And he took on the name Innocent for his papal name. He was the third to take on that name, Pope Innocent III. He was, by most accounts, the most powerful pope who ever reigned. And when he became pope, he selected as his ordination passage of Scripture a passage from the first chapter of Jeremiah. This was his ordination verse. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, Pope Innocent III lived by those words. Those were the words that guided his actions. And so he did indeed uproot and he tore down, and he overthrew, and he destroyed, and he did whatever it took to secure his power, and he was effective. He threatened excommunication for anyone who disagreed with him, and he had the rulers of the world quaking because of his power. About the same time, there was another man. His name was Francis from the town of Assisi. Francis was privileged in his youth. He went off as a soldier. He was captured. He was a prisoner of war. And it was during that experience that he, that he met Christ. And it was during that experience that he felt the call of Christ to minister to and live with and serve with the poorest of the poor. And so Francis took on that poverty himself 
and he lived with lepers, and he touched the untouchable, and he cared for, motivated by faith, and motivated by love, and persevering through hope. Francis made a difference in the lives of many. See, he gathered a following, and the followers all took the same vow of poverty, and they were a ragged bunch. And Francis, wanting to found a new order, a religious order, knew that he had to go and see the Pope, Benedict, uh, Pope Innocent III. And so he went to Rome, and he and his ragtag band appeared before the Pope in the papal palace, and the Pope smirked and said, Go lie down with the pigs. And you know what he did? He went and found a pigsty. He got down on the ground. He wallowed in the mud. And then he went back to see the Pope. The Pope didn't know what to do with that. What does he do? He didn't know what to do except to grant him permission, probably thinking it wouldn't come to anything, to found an order. Or perhaps he was moved in a way that he had not been before. And he gave permission, and the Franciscan order was born. And colleges and hospitals and orphanages and social service agencies throughout the world and down through the centuries have had an impact on countless numbers of lives because what guides one's actions matters, and it matters a great deal. Ten popes after Pope Innocent III took the name as their papal name, Innocent. But only one took the name Francis, and it's the current pope of the Roman Catholic Church, as you know. And in taking the name Francis, he was very clear about why he wanted to say with that name what it is that would guide his actions. And so he pointed back all those centuries to an impoverished, a willfully impoverished man named Francis who in many ways changed the world. What guides our actions makes all the difference. This past week, I was talking to a member of our church, and the conversation turned to all that members of our congregation are doing. It turned to the vocation of the Christians who are part of this community of faith. She pointed out that her Sunday school class has a fair amount of absenteeism because some members of her class are teaching children, or they're volunteering in the Welcome Center, or they're helping out in the office, or they're doing something else to be of service as greeters, maybe filling in as an usher if there is a need at 930 when their class meets, or at 11 if their class meets then. And she talked about running into people all over the place and how amazing it was to see members of this congregation whose work, whose efforts must be motivated by something special. And they keep after it because they're at the hospital volunteering or they're volunteering for Habitat for Humanity or they're working on some board of an important nonprofit in this community. They're giving of their time and their talents and their treasure to the Methodist Justice Ministry or to First Street Mission or to uh, the uh, uh, Caring Place or to Ladder Alliance. I mean, the list is long. Look around and you see the church at work. When Paul talked about the church, he wasn't talking about one particular place. He was talking about the people of faith in that community being guided by faith and love and sustained by hope. As we go from this place, let our lives be so guided. Amen.